Hello, everybody. I'm just going to give you guys a few minutes to get on here. I know I'm a few minutes late. And I know it takes Facebook sometimes a few minutes. So when you get on, because Facebook has been acting weird lately, and I can see people either on or I can't see them on. It all depends on what Facebook feels like cooperating with that day. So if you could please just put a hi on there so I know who's watching, that would be wonderful. I can see there are four of you so far. And I'm doing this without the computer, so I don't have the aid of the second thing to read. Hi, Susan. Hi, Kate. Hi, Lori. Hi, Paula. I just want to give it a few minutes. I know there was a lot of response to this, so I want to make sure everybody who wanted to see um, has a chance to jump on. So Facebook, um, I went on live for my business a couple uh, last night and the night before, and it kept kicking off the live. So if the live ends suddenly, it's not that I ended it, it's a Facebook issue. Um, and I certainly, I certainly will, um, hi Grace, I certainly will jump right back on if that's the case. Susan, did you mean to try to join the video? <laughs> It just asked me if you could join the video. I've actually been thinking about um, doing that so when you guys ask questions, everybody can see your beautiful faces as well. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> okay, then I guess that wasn't on purpose. Okay, so there's nine of you watching now. So hello to anybody else who came in and didn't drop a hello. Um, I'm gonna turn my camera so you can see my prep space and how I've got things prepared thus far. Um, oh, okay, a watch party. I, I think that's what they call it, right? So I'm gonna turn this so you can see pretty much how I have things set up. Again, before I start any project like this, I always sanitize all surfaces. Um, you can use whatever um, you choose in your home um, as long as it you know is going to be disinfecting um, whether it's white vinegar bleach um, some people use Lysol um, whatever whatever suits your own purposes um, but I just want to go ahead and show you the areas that I have prepped the tools that I have out um, and that way you can see what we're doing now because we're doing um, four different things. One, we're going to make garlic powder. We're going to also make garlic salt. That's number two. Number three is we're going to process parsley. And then number four, we're gonna process rosemary. So I'm gonna flip the camera now so you can get a see on what I've got out. Hey, Angela. Okay, so here's my workspace. I've got my handy dandy ninja waiting to be used. I've got not one, but two jars of garlic. I've got several um, storage jars here that are already sanitized. Pay no attention to the fabric in the background because I'm still sewing. Um, <laughs> but according to what my needs are going to be, because we're doing four different things, I've got four different jars. They're already sterile. Now, it's important to remember that if you decide to process an herb, don't wait until you're ready to process to clean your jars because you don't want any moisture in the jars at all, not in your lids, not in your jars itself, 
um, and just wiping it with a towel will get most of the moisture out, but it won't get all of the moisture out. So you really want it to have a chance to air dry and be completely, um, oh, thank you, Vicki. It's a work in progress. We're gonna be doing a remodel here soon. Um, so yeah, you definitely wanna make sure you have all your moisture out. And again, if you live in an area where you have high moisture content just in your everyday air, like in Florida, it's, it's an extremely moist environment, um, you may want to take some money and invest in food grade silica packets that you can pack in your herb jars to make sure that your jars are staying um, airtight and dry if you have a vacuum seal jar thing, you can use that to make sure you don't have any additional moisture. But you know, as you open your herbs, you're gonna have that continual exchange of air. So if you live in a damp environment, I think it's definitely worth the investment. Um, so I also have a funnel for pouring into the jars so we don't make a mess everywhere. Um, I've got a quarter cup measuring cup, which I already have some of my home ground garlic powder in. Um, you may have remembered on one of the other lives I showed you my homegrown garlic. Um, it is a little bit stuck in that jar. Stuck in the groove. Um, so I'll go ahead and put that in there. And you can see I just cleaned a store one, a store jar, and I reused it. You certainly can do that. Um, my preference is glass only because um, I like working with glass, but also because of the chemicals that plastics leach. Um, but because I have you know, other herbs that I buy in bulk from the store in these giant containers. Um, you know, I like to reuse them rather than just throw them out. Um, I have a knife here that I use to level off my cup of salt, which is sitting right there. I have a pen, um, sticky pads that I can turn into labels, some tape to go over it to make sure we don't have any smudging. This is the top to, um, or the bottom respectively, depending on which direction the cup is sitting, um, with the blending tool that we're gonna to be using. Um, I have a nice whisk that we're gonna be using to blend the garlic salt. Um, I've got some parsley already in the cup ready to be blended. Um, you can see my jar of salt. I've got parsley here. Um, and what else here? I've got some garlic already in the cup. And you can see this ring here, this is not dirty. This is from blending garlic. Um, because the garlic chips are so hard and dry, it will scratch the plastic. So if you have uh, an older cup from your Ninja or your food processor, um, I recommend it because you will have scratches um, in it unless you're using something like glass. And even the glass, I think maybe you might have the potential of scratching. Um, and then, so we're gonna turn around here. So this is all the parsley we have to dry, that's already dried, um, that we're gonna process, and that is the rosemary. So I've got everything out and ready. So first things first, um, we've got some chips already in here, and I'm gonna go ahead and blend those first. Nate, would you? I'm gonna need another set of hands. Nathaniel? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make sure that's on there tight. Can you? You wanna tighten this or do you wanna? All right, and then we're gonna stick it in here. And it's gonna get loud, so. a nice fine powder. So there we go. And the same thing applies to your um, your blender cups. You want to make sure everything is you tighten that so tight I can't do it. Make me look like a wimp. <laughs> tap 
that off inside so we don't lose any powder here. And then see? So I'm gonna go ahead. Nate, can you hold this again? Let's focus right here. I'll go ahead and add to this. So I'm going to go ahead and take this quarter cup, put it in the bowl. The garlic salt is one part garlic to four parts salt. We already have my cup measured here. So I'm going to put that in there. Put this up in the bowl. Can you focus right there? Thanks. And then you're just going to mix it. Now I mentioned um, the other day that when I make garlic powder, I like to have some parsley in it. It gives it a nice flavor. So I'm just gonna go ahead, and rather than switch this because I don't want it wet, got some parsley already pre-picked. Oops, I get that crooked. There we go, that goes on much smoother now. Now we're gonna go ahead and You don't really need too much with the parsley. See, it's so light, you don't want to really hold it because it's going to... I put a piece of wax paper underneath my stand because I didn't want to have to show you how I fight with my stand to move it because I'm a weakling. <laughs> but um, now it's going to slide everywhere. Um, so far, Jane, hi, Jane. I have blended some garlic um, and I just blended some parsley. We're making garlic salt first and then we're going to finish making garlic powder. So now this one, I'm just going to add it by sight because I know pretty much what I like. So I'm going to sprinkle it in. It's not quite what I want. There we go. You want to make sure you're not mixing it too aggressively because the powder will go up your nose, like you just did mine. So that's pretty, pretty much it. And then, because I want to be able to shake it, I'm going to be using one of these reusable containers. And stay right there. Funnel because I don't want to congest that tiny one. And then I'm just going to use the measuring cup I had and pour it in. down low. Just give it a pour. All right. And that is how you make your homemade garlic salt. And then I'm just going to take my pen. And today is the 6th? Yeah, because yesterday was some good mayo. And then I'm going to go ahead and I don't have any packing tape today. So what I'll do is I'll just use the scotch tape in layers. 
that'll keep it from smearing should I grab it with white hands while I'm cooking. And that is pretty much it for garlic salt. So I'm gonna just kind of move my mess because everything else I make is gonna be just plain garlic powder. And I'm gonna be able to transfer it right from that cup right into the funnel and into the container. So I still have a good amount of powder here, you can see. Now because I just emptied this, which actually I'm gonna bang out into the other, because I can see there's a little bit that was caught in the groove. I'm just gonna kind of flip it upside down, give it a tap. So this will get washed and sterilized, um, and then I'll take the sticker the rest of the way off, and then I will reuse it. So now I'm gonna use this container, which held garlic granules before, and I'm just gonna you just want to give it a gentle tap and I don't know about you but we, we put garlic pretty much in everything um, our family loves garlic so fill that back up that again please good grief You can see it takes quite a few chips to make that little bit of a, of a powder. So I'll probably have to do this two more times. Maybe I'll get a little bit of having to do it again. So yeah, I'm going to call that good enough because another one is probably going to put me over. Yeah, I see a bunch of questions. I'll get to those in just a second. So that is granulated or powdered garlic. And you can see I did a little bit chunkier and a little bit thinner, so it's a nice blend. And there we go. So I'll label that with one of these sticky pads. Would you grab me a clean cloth so I can clean this area? Thank you. Okay, and we'll put a label on that. I will answer all your questions in just one second. Probably not. Wait, 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 one second. So I'm just making my label. Alright, and then I'm going to go ahead and put that over it, and then I will put 
Can you rinse that? That's gonna have to be washed. This I'm done with. And I'm gonna clean up my area. So it's really quite simple. It gets done. So I'm gonna let this air dry while I answer your questions before we start the next thing. These two can go in the sink, they're done. All right, so let me scroll back. I'm gonna flip you around. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, Dawn, thank you for showing the garlic powder. You're welcome. Yes, I can just dose it out, um, teaspoon, tablespoon. I can put a shaker thing on the top of it and use it that way. Hi, Lynn. Um, yep, that's pretty much it. Dawn, I will be having videos on about how to dry herbs. Um, a blender, depending on how strong. Now, these garlic chips are pretty tough. Um, they're, when I say tough, I don't mean like tough as in like pliable tough. I mean like they're hard, they're sharp. Um, so, yes, I would think, yes, it would work. Um, if I didn't have a ninja, then I would definitely be using um, a blender. So drying herbs is pretty simple. Now you can see right up there, my husband being the wonderful man he is, when he put that shelf up for my teapots, he used these brackets that have the rod holders on them. They're meant for closets. Um, but because I do so much dehydrating um, and drying of herbs and all that stuff, um, because we, we do so much of it, um, he installed that so that I can take a curtain rod and hang my herbs from it. Now, um, I have another one that's in the pantry, which was an old converted bedroom. Um, you'll notice I don't have on that window a curtain, and that's because I don't use it unless I'm dehydrating the, the curtain rod itself. I don't use it unless I'm um, drying, air drying herbs. Um, now there are two ways you can dry herbs. You can use a dehydrator, which is a rapid dehydration, um, depending on the herb and depending on what your settings on your dehydrator are, you have the potential of cooking your herb, which takes away some of the nutrients. Personally, I prefer to air dry. Now, because you're air drying and because I'm using windows, now the one in the bedroom that we converted to a pantry, that has a shade on it, so there's no direct light on it, and the herbs stay nice and green. Yes, that's why they were there. Um, when you hang herbs in a window, you will have a certain amount of yellowing from the light. The light in the window actually can damage the herbs. So if you have the potential of drying it in a dark space, then absolutely do it. So with my parsley, because I have such abundance of parsley, I'm more willing to take the risk of drying them in a window where I might have some um, nutrients lost or yellowing. Um, so when I go through and do the parsley, you'll notice that I'm gonna pick out what's yellow and I'm gonna discard that because even though it will taste the same, um, you're gonna have a loss of nutrients. And for me, when I cook, when I use them medicinally, because we do use them for teas, um, I'm all about the nutrients that are in our foods. So I wanna make sure that we have the best that we can have. Um, so with that, I'm gonna wash my hands because I just touched my eye. And I'll be right back. I'm just gonna turn this here and I'll let you stare at this beautiful parsley while I wash my hands. So sanitary practices are key.
Oh, yeah. Nathan, did you leave that clock on the counter? No, she can't see. Yeah, I can't just touch that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one more time. And we're gonna get our clean towel now because that one is too wet. Nate, can you please take care of that wet cloth? You left it out. Okay, so Dawn is asking, would a basement be good to dry them? That is completely dependent on how moist your basement is. If your basement is damp and has any mold issues or mildew issues, my, my advice to that would be no, don't do it there. Um, if you have a good dry basement that has rafters that you can hang it from, sure. Um, if you have an attic space that doesn't have moisture, that's even better. In fact, most of the time, I would prefer to hang it in an attic space because it's cooler, it's darker, and most of the time it's drier. I dry my garlic in my Waring Brothers dehydrator. Um, so when I, when I say we do garlic, number one, right now in my garlic bed, I have 400 heads. So imagine those heads that you buy at the store, 400 of those. Um, so when we process garlic, we process a lot of garlic. It takes me about three days uh, to run the dehydrator consistently. Um, garlic, as well as garlic scapes, are extremely pungent, so you want to be able to do them in a well-ventilated area because it will burn your eyes, it will burn your sinuses, um, because they are that pungent. Um, so what I like to do is I put them in my pantry room, I crack the window so they have some ventilation. You can do them in a shed, you can do them in an outside porch with some ventilation, um, but your goal really is to, you know, make them as dry as possible so they are like a chip. Um, I just peel the heads, take the cloves out, um, put them through my food processor with a slicing blade, and then layer them in the dehydrator. I have five tiers in my dehydrator, and um, I check it pretty frequently, probably every few hours, um, because sometimes you'll notice in dehydrators you'll have one rack that's more dry than the other, so don't be afraid to reorganize your racks and move the top rack to the bottom and vice versa. Do whatever you need to do to make sure that they all dry evenly. If you have one rack that is completely dry before the rest, take it out. Um, you want it to be a nice, firm, crispy chip. And um, I don't know who, we talked about garlic pres preservation, I don't know who may not have seen, but this is a garlic chip. This is what it looks like. And so, did you hear that crack? Oh, and a piece of it hit the floor. So, I mean, it's a good, good dry chip. And the key to making this last is to make sure that there's no moisture in your jars. I have several of these jars um, because we use so much of it. And then I just, you know, blend it as I need it. And we go from there. So any more questions about garlic? I would not oven dry garlic, um, Dawn. Number one, because the process would take so long, um, you would have basically no use of your oven. And for my family, that just would not work. And the other risk with that is that you would be cooking it and you wouldn't get an even dehydration. I, I would really prefer, for my own personal use, a dehydrator. If you don't have a dehydrator, then you know you have to do what you have to do. Um, but with a dehydrator, those racks that they have in it have that nice aerated um, tray so you have more air circulating. The more air circulating, the more your chips are gonna dry evenly and quickly. You're welcome, Judy. So with that, unless there are more questions about garlic, then um, we will move on to parsley. So I'll just give you a minute while I take a sip of my water. My dog is talking. <laughs> and if you all want to, um, I'm noticing when I looked out my kitchen window, I have some strawberries that are coming awake and um, the rhubarb 
is starting to perk up. Draw your help. The husband has one. Just have to find it. Definitely find it. It's worth the find. Worth the, worth the search. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn to parsley. Okay, so I already have some here. And you can see what I mean. Some of it's really nice and green, and there is some that has some yellowing to it. Um, I picked out most of the strongly yellowed, but you can see like there's some here that will need to be picked out. This is probably one of the easiest things for you to do. So I'm just gonna set my phone here. Maybe not. And do you have a good view of that? I think you do. So basically, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna pick these heads off. And then this is already chopped, so I'm gonna put that in this jar first. And I'm just gonna put it in the jar as I pick it off. When you get going and you're more accustomed to it, you'll learn you can just kind of pull it off and then rip up the stems. You wanna make sure you get the stems out. It's really pretty quick. See now this one, there's pretty much no yellow. So I'm just gonna go ahead and strip it down. Pull out the smaller stems. You can hear it's a nice crisp because it's so well dried. And I grow several varieties of parsley. This is a curly parsley. It's a little bit of a messy process, so I like to have wax paper underneath. Um, it's so much easier to clean up than having like a towel because, you know, things like to stick to fabric. And it's okay if you get some minor stem stuck in it like these, that's okay because when you blend it, it's going to automatically separate that and then you can just pick it out so it makes it a little bit easier um, that one's a little bit too yellow I think see that one's nice and green and see I just pulled it up mm, that one's got some yellow so I'm going to pass on that Pretty easy process. Not a whole lot of work. Oh, it has a little bit of a thicker stem. Those two pieces there are too yellow. I'm use these ones. Sorry, I pulled my arms out of the camera view, I know, I'm sorry. I'm so used to just doing what I do. You can even use some kitchen shears to trim the edges if you want to. The 
great part about having this in the house though is that I've been able to pretty much go in there all winter and just pick off what I want when I'm making soups or whatnot. So my blender top has been washed. I'm just gonna give this a dry because I wanna make sure there's no moisture. I don't want garlic in with my parsley, you know? All right. And then we're ready to blend it. Um, Susan, the batch really is dependent on what the temperature is outside, what the temperature is in the house, how much moisture is in the house. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about garlic. The, Don, the parsley we're processing today is curly. Yes, there is. Um, and it's really a culinary difference. But this is real to par processing. Oh, there we go. And you can see that one cup does not make all that much. Um, bear with me one minute, and honey, I'll answer that question just for for you in a minute. Nate, would you grab my computer? Because I don't want to stick my foot in my mouth with Dawn's question here. Um, flat leaf parsleys are typically Italian parsleys. So not very much, and it takes a lot to do this, so. And then I'm just gonna kind of clean up. And then Grab the next batch down. Bear with me one second, guys. Just want to type in my password without advertising it to YouTube. How's that? Now I will tell you, I use both curly and flat leaf parsleys. Um, specifically um, for teas and things like that. Um, if you have kidney issues, parsley is wonderful as a diuretic. Um, and so it's, it's really, really helpful. So in general, flat leaf parsley has a more robust flavor. Um, if you're going to do like an Italian dish where you sprinkle things on top, parsley on top, that's something you want to do. Curly leaf has less flavor, um, 
but it still has the same properties. Um, it can taste more bitter. And let's see, let's see what else this is. It. Let me see what this one says. Oh, pretty much everything I just said. Okay, so flat, bold, aromatic flavor, color ranging from dark green to bright green, leafy green. Yeah, so flat leaf parsley basically has a stronger flavor. <laughs> Lynn, that's awesome. Okay, so Judy's question is, does parsley have to be completely mature when you dry it? Um, the answer is no. Um, when, and of course, that depends on what your definition of mature is. When I think of a mature plant, and please remember that I've been doing this for a long time, I'm thinking of something that is flowering or about to flower. When you are doing herbs, you do not want them to go to flower. When they go to flower, they go to seed. Um, so they're preparing to rest for the season. So pretty much think, think the life cycle of a spider. When a spider has their egg sac, they die. They're done. Um, same thing happens with plants. When they go to seed, um, their production slows. They're getting ready to rest. Absolutely, Don. You can blend them both together. For the lay person, parsley is parsley. It's really a culinary difference, um, you know, as far as flavor is concerned for everything else. Any other questions for parsley? So basically the process um, for this next batch is exactly the same as what I just showed you. Um, so would you like to finish seeing that out till I have all of that done? Or would you like to move on to rosemary? You're welcome, Dawn. I don't want to tie you up on here all day either. So I'm thinking maybe we should just move on to rosemary. Now, I will be honest and tell you, processing rosemary is probably one of my not so favorites. Um, and the reason is, is because depending on the size of your rosemary plants, they can be rather woody. And when I say woody, I mean the stalk gets like a shrub almost. Um, and it can be painful, literally. They, um, when, you, when they're dry, they can be kind of sharp. So you wanna exercise some caution. Um, as you process and learn how to process various foods and herbs and you garden and things like that, you're going to find that your skin toughens up, um, but you still have the potential of poking yourself. It's not something that I wear gloves for because it's just gonna poke through the gloves. So with that said, we're gonna go ahead and move on to, I see Dawn agrees with me, she wrote Rosemary. So I'm gonna go ahead and move my wax paper here. I didn't get the answer about the dehydration of garlic or how you dry it to grind it. Okay, so do, um, Laura's asking about the process for garlic again. So we'll just go over that again one more time. Um, <laughs> let me just move this, sorry. Mm -hmm. Now that I have it out here. Okay, so garlic, Laura, is pretty simple. Um, we pull it from the ground, we rack it, we let it develop the paper, we trim the roots off of it, we chop the stalk off of it, and then we bring it inside. Um, from there, you open the clove, uh, sorry, you open the bulb, take out the cloves, peel the cloves, put them through a food processor with a slicing blade, Put them evenly on dehydrator racks, and then once your racks are full, you go ahead and set up your dehydrator in a well-ventilated area and let it run for however long you get to dry it completely. 
Um, my dehydrator typically runs for about three days straight running all the garlics, but like I told the ladies before, I have 400 heads in the ground. Every year that increases. So we're meaning to do garlic as a side business as we get older. And, you know, so we're gonna to continue to increase our garlic crop. I will have a lot more videos on herbs, Laura, um, sorry, <laughs> Dawn. Sorry, my dog is barking. Um, we, we go through a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of herbs. So my herb wall that I shared pictures of is typically full and bloomed um, by the end of the summer and we harvest from it all year. Um, I recommend that as your crops grow, for those that can be sustained by bean harvest while they grow, that you do so. Um, especially because you want to keep your herbs from going to seed, which basically when it produces a flower shoot means it's going to get ready to go to seed. So by all means, continually harvest from those from those herbs that you can. Um, now the rosemary here, I'm just going to move my computer. Nathan, can you help me? Because I don't have enough hands. Oh, what did I bang over? That's fine. So just a quick clean up on my counter again. I have two dogs. Um, I am a former, well, I shouldn't say I'm a former rescuer um, because I would still do rescue dogs. I used to do some work with the Pixel Fund and if you're looking to adopt a dog and save a life, um, they take their dogs from kill shelters in Florida and Georgia and they have wonderful foster system and they adopt them out to families. And I worked with them for quite a while and that's how I got my dog. So Baxter is, his mom was a full-blood Great Pyrenees, but he's a mutt daddy. <laughs> so he's a mix. He kind of looks like a yellow lab, but with a curly tail um, and a black, black speckled tongue. So, and then I have a um, Basset Hound Beagle mix and I'm sorry, I just said that wrong. Basset Hound Dotson mix. So she kind of, well, she looks, she looks like a Basset Hound in body form, but her nose is long like a Dotson, um, and she's very squat to the ground. I, I love my wearing brothers, Lynn. That is the dehydrator I use. That's the one I love. Nathan, you want to take that out so they can actually see it? Maybe that would help. Sorry, I asked him to come over and then I got talking. Okay. So I'm going to move this because I dropped some parsley in it. And I'm just going to grab a bunch. Ugh. And I'll tell you what, rosemary makes such a mess. It smells incredible, but it makes a horrid, horrid mess. So he's getting out. You can just bring it here and... So this is Nate. And that is my dehydrator. So it's got the five racks, the cover, it has a vent on the top, um, and you just plug it in, turn it on, and you go. Nate, would you open up this and get me a piece of paper on the counter? Okay, go ahead. He's trying to avoid the camera. Lynn, if you're going to um, process your own foods, there are some things that are worth the investments. I agree. They can be very pricey depending on what brand you decide to go with. Um, but for me, it really was an investment. I have had this wearing since 2003. I think since 2003. So 17 years and it's still kicking. To me, that's, that's worth the investment. Okay, so I'm gonna move my wax paper. Nate, can you film this while I manhandle? So I'm going to turn this around and you can just focus on the paper in my hands. <clears throat> so this is rosemary. 
And first things first, I'm going to snip the string. And remove it. And you can see what I mean by it being messy because it's already. So, what, what will come off easily is already falling apart here. So you can throw that away. And so you're just going to start at this end and strip. Now, all plants, to some degree, even when you wash them, you're going to have some grime that sticks. You have to remember they come out of the ground, so they're going to have some dirt. And when you water them, dirt splatters and whatnot. So you can see on the paper here from the bunch, there's a little bit of dirt. And I will show you how to get that out in just a moment. And this is really great. If you have a, if you ever have a like a stuffy nose from allergies, rosemary will certainly clean it out. And it's really just this little bowl. This came off of a rather large plant, and you can see what I mean here about the woody stalks. You know, they're pretty, it's like wood inside. So, they are a little bit pokey. And the smell is, I don't know, I think it's pretty much almost like a pine, like a Christmas pine type of smell. And at the heads, like when you have this bolt here, what you can't get in this direction, you can get in the reverse direction and then just break that final tip off. Let's put some sticks on it. I'm just gonna break off. And that's pretty much how you do rosemary. And your hands are going to smell wonderful, but they will be sore. But it is so worth it to know that there was never any pesticides on this. There were never any chemical exposures. They're organic. Um, I only use organic manure. You know, I try to deal with all my pests organically. Try to use companion planting so we don't have the pests. We have pests every year. We have to deal with it to some varying degree, but not as bad as it could be. I really wish smell would translate into video. Any questions? Yes, you can, Judy. You can dry them in the dehydrator. The caution that I would give you, though, is um, if you're not going to be attending to it frequently, um, it may not be the thing for you because if you think about the way a dehydrator works, you have the circulation of the air combined with a slight heat, which will dry it without cooking it. Um, if you're not attentive or if your dehydrator does not have a setting low, especially for herbs, you can end up cooking your herb rather than um, drying it. And then you lose the nutrients of it. Any others? So this is pretty much all there is to it. And as soon as I finish this sponge, which is going to take a minute, then I will show you how to do with this. Okay. 
Any other questions? Get a nice pile going. And if you can focus in on these, see these little barbs right here? This is where those stems were, and that is what tears up your fingers. Okay, so we'll throw this batch of stems away. Put them on one of the piles later. So just kind of sort through, to remove any other pieces. Now, unlike the parsley and the garlic, I don't typically blend these. All right, so that's pretty much it there. I'm just gonna grab a mesh colander. And then this is where the paper comes in. So, so handy. <clears throat> and I'll just put it together. Get a second piece. Move that here. Just keep my surface semi clean. And then pour it right in. Oh, you can see I missed a stick there. That's fine. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give this a little shake. Do you see the dirt coming out? You can wash this when you first pick it, but you will always have some remnants of dirt. And that little bit that came out with the dirt, I'm not even going to worry about. By the way, if you're doing like a, if you have a little hot dog pit or um, you know a little outside fireplace, you can put that in your fireplace, and it smells so yummy, yummy, yummy. So then I'm just gonna take my jar and Elijah, could you come hide the hold the phone because your brother just disappeared on me. Oh, you're welcome, Judy. Thank you. Just give it a little tap. And that is how we process rosemary. And it smells so yummy. So any questions about rosemary? I'm 
just gonna take the rosemary remnants off my fingers here. You don't have to wash your hands one-sided. One-handed, I mean. And that is pretty much it. So that is how we do rosemary, garlic, garlic salt, and parsley. You're welcome. You can see my hands are scratched up a little bit. But I still have all of that to do. <laughs> so would you all like to go out and see what's popped up since the last outside trip? Or are you pretty much done with today? Donna is saying yes. Okay. Just don't want to keep you guys, if you have other things you need to get doing. So let me just grab my flip-flops. Um, Christine, dry canning, let's, let's address that since you brought it up. Dry canning is a process of using no water to can. Um, people do it one of two ways. Um, either in their oven or they do it in um, their canner, but they just don't add water. So it depends on which dry cannon you're discussing. Dry cannon, as far as dry canning in your oven, is not a recommended process because the glass that canning jars is, are made out of are not made to have a dry heat. They're made for moist heat. So that is not something that I would recommend. There are certain products that you can dry can if you get a good seal safely, assumably that it heats through. You're welcome, Susan, have a great day. Um, but there are certain things that are very dangerous to do. For example, brown rice. Brown rice, when it's dry canned in an oven, um, goes rancid. And a lot of dry canners, when they do their tutorials, do not show you that. Um, dry canning as far as canning in a pressure canner or a water bath canner without liquid is extremely dangerous. So there's a big fat no on that one. Um, and the reason that it's dangerous is because when you have contents in a jar, you need to make sure the contents in the jar give you enough volume to adequately produce the pressure to push out the air in the canning jar. Without the fluid, like as an example for potatoes, I've seen on a couple of these other boards where they dry can potatoes. Extremely dangerous. Um, number one, you don't have the liquid in the jar to heat the product adequately through. Potatoes are dense. They need the liquid to help move the juices through the potato in order to reach the 240 degrees to kill the spores that cause the botulism toxin. Um, so no, it also does not allow the pressure to build within the jar to push the air out. So therefore you have air spores still inside the canning jar, which can also grow mold, yeast, and other bacteria. So absolutely no, no to dry canning. Um, we will, I am doing some research as far as oven dry canning for things like flowers and sugars. Um, and I'm going to be doing a video at some point um, discussing the pros and cons, but realistically, the jars that are used are still not made for that dry heat and the dry, dry excuse me, the jar fracturing is a continued risk that you have and then you lose not only the jar but also the contents in the jar. So I am not a huge fan of the idea at all. Um, but that said, I am continuing some research on it. Um, but it's not something that I have found any support research-wise for. Any other questions on that?
Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera. It's gorgeous here today. So you can see my lilies and my tulips. Um, I've got some herbs here too. Um, where are you? Let me see. Oh, right there, there. So this plant right here, let me see if I can, that one right there, that is yarrow. And yarrow is a fantastic herb. Um, if you, you can use it for teas, you can use it for tinctures. Um, I like to keep jarred yarrow on hand because if you have um, a deep cut that you can't get to stop bleeding, that actually will clot the cut. Um, so it's fantastic. And you can see my apple trees are starting to bud out. So we're going to have some nice, nice apples showing up here. And then my tulips migrated outside the bed, so I'm going to have to have that re-edged. This is um, rhubarb. And you can can rhubarb. I can mine in a syrup. Um, works great to use later. Chives have poked up. And you can see I've got some mint. That's kind of live. I still haven't come out to do a adequate cleanup. I've just been busy with other things. And I need to get these pruned. But you can see the raspberries are already starting to bud. So that's good. And you can see since last week, we have all kinds of garlic spikes poking up through their nice deep bed of straw. And over here, looky, looky, strawberries. So they're all coming to life. So now is the time to get the weeding done, thin as we need to thin. And then I'm gonna put some stones throughout to make harvesting easier. So yeah. That is pretty much all the changes I have for you today. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, thank you, Dawn. They'll look a lot better come clean up. So without any other questions, I will go ahead and let you all go. I hope you have a wonderful day. If you have any questions about um, what we learned today, go ahead and post them in comments and I'll be sure to get on and answer them. Have a great day.